Good evening. Amen. Open your Bibles up to the book of James. James chapter 3 is where we're going to be at uh, this evening as we learn about true, wi true wisdom uh, from verses 13 to 18. Um, as I look around and I just kind of watch what's going on in the world around me, and as I even think about how I respond to certain situations, uh, I've come to realize that uh, we are in desperate need of wisdom, right? right? Everyone, there's a, there's a great vacuum, there's a great lack of wisdom in the world today. Uh, you know, God has created us all with the ability to think and the ability to reason. Right. Now, not all of us take advantage of that, and some do more than the other. Uh, we all have various opinions on all sorts of topics and issues. Some of those opinions are very strong, if you haven't noticed, right? That, that, that's a lot of tension nowadays that we, we can't disagree on anything, that this person holds this opinion and this one holds this opinion, and it turns into uh, a lot of tension and, and angst. Uh, we all have our own thoughts, it seems, uh, on what is right and what is wrong. Some will say, well, that's, that might be wrong for you, but it's not wrong for me. Those type of things, that, that truth has become relative. There's no such thing as absolute truth. So what is it that shapes our opinions? And, and how do we determine what is right and what is wrong? We have all these different things that influence us, right? Every day. It's the culture around us. It's social media. It's what we see on the nightly news, depending on what stations you watch. We're all being influenced different ways. Talk radio, podcasts we listen to, even friends and family are what shapes these things. It's also the movies that we watch, the TV shows that we watch, the music we listen to, and the books that we read. Right. Right? All these things are, are what shapes our opinions. And begins us to, to think certain, certain ways and uh, influence us. All these things are influencing us on how to determine what is right, what is wrong. And they're doing it whether we realize it or not. We're, like, we're being programmed. That's what's happening. That, that's how we can start, start to, to lean a certain direction. Lean this way or lean that way based off of what we're being told. Right? And, oh, that sounds good. Right? I, I tend to agree with that. Doesn't matter if it sounds good or you tend to agree with it, is it right? That's right. Is it right according to God's word? That's what matters. It's all these things, right? That's why what we watch matters. It's why what we read matters. That's why what we listen to matters. That's, right. That's why we who we who we listen to matters. Right? Even if they are friends or family members, we need to know. We need to be aware of these things. Now, of course, as far as of Christ, our thoughts and opinions should primarily be shaped and influenced by the Word of God. Right. Right. Everybody would agree with that. Right. right? We would agree with that, and yet we don't always do that. We know it's the right thing. We know it should be that way. But in reality, it's not always the case. But that can't happen if we rarely spend time reading God's Word, studying God's Word, meditating on God's Word, praying God's Word. It can't have any influence on us if we never expose ourselves to it. We can't expect to let the things of this world influence us six days a week and the Word of God only influences us one day of the week and expect for that to turn out right. That's right. If we're being inundated by the things of the world and the voice of the world and the, the culture around us six days a week and we think we're going to come here on, on Sundays and all of a sudden it's all going to be washed away. This one time a week is going to just overwhelm and just delete everything that you've been exposed to all week. You're kidding yourself. That's right. You're kidding yourself. You must stay in God's Word. Always pray it up. Have God's Word lead us and direct us. 
I don't know about you, but I tend to make unwise decisions when I haven't spent time with God and His Word. Amen. I make unwise decisions whenever I, as we've talked about earlier, in discipleship, and I don't, I don't spend time in prayer. Or I just move on ahead. I just, you know, I don't, I don't need to pray about this. Well, that's a mistake. That's right. That's a mistake. We're, we're asking for trouble when we have that type of an attitude, that type of a mindset. We tend to make unwise decisions when we do not spend time with God and His Word on a regular basis, every day. We know this is true, and yet it still happens all the time, right? That's right. Even if you don't, if you, even if you don't want to admit it, you don't have to admit it. Yeah, you don't have to. We can look around. The proof is in the pudding. We can look around us and see that it's true. The evidence is everywhere. In the wrecked marriages, the, the wrecked homes, the financial disasters. The relational carnage everywhere. Why? Because we're not living our lives according to the wisdom of God's word. That's right. So how could this be? How could this be? There's a number of reasons for it. But the primary reason is that we don't really believe in the wisdom and the authority of God's word. Again, we like to say that we do. Because that's the church answer. Do you believe in the authority of God's word? And everybody raise their hand. Amen. I believe in the authority of God's word. Brother Mike, what about the wisdom of God's word? Do you believe that, that, that God is all knowing and all wise in his word? That's where we get the wisdom from. Amen. I believe that. So, so why don't we act like we believe it? Amen. Why are we looking for wisdom in so many other Places. That's right. Right? <laughs> Song, we're looking for love in all the wrong places. I think we're looking for wisdom in all the wrong places. That's right. We've reduced the Bible to being nothing more than another history book. Hmm. Got a, hey dad, I, I got a paper I need to write about, about, about Jews or something back in like the first century. How can, can you help me with this? Yeah, here, take, take this history book and go look at it. Mm. You got some stuff in there you can probably get learn from. You can make sure you use footnotes. Don't want to be accused of plagiarism, right? Mm. But it's more than that. It's more than another history book. We reduced it to being just another book with helpful tips and advice on how we can be good moral people, just like all the other self-help books that are out there. The Bible is much more than a history book. The Bible is certainly much more than a book of advice. That's right. The Bible is God's Word. Right. Yeah. It's God's Word. And it doesn't just contain the words of God. It is the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Right? We should think of it that way. We should view it that way. It is without error, and it has absolute authority over the lives of every believer. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Church, we are in desperate need of wisdom. That's right. Desperate need of wisdom. But it must be the right kind of wisdom. The right kind of wisdom. Like our bodies need calories to be healthy and to function properly. But just like our bodies, they need the right type of calories. Now I know this. I did some experiments. That our bodies can't function properly just by eating a steady diet of Bluebell ice cream and Popeye's chicken sandwiches. <laughs> that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Your body will begin to reject those things at some point or another. That, that is unwise. That is unwise. And so don't try it. What we need, church, is true wisdom. True wisdom. What we need is the kind of wisdom that is from above. Amen. And that's what James will tell us tonight. And so let's grab our Bibles now and let's stand together as we honor God's Word. James chapter 3. Verses 13 to 18, James writes, 
Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without hypocrisy, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Yeah. This is God's word. Father, we come to you tonight. Admitting that we are a people. That we are a church. That we are individuals that are in desperate need of wisdom. Not just any type of wisdom, but the type of wisdom that comes from above. Mm -hmm. True wisdom. Father, your word tells us if anyone needs wisdom to ask, and you will give without partiality. So, Father, we're asking tonight that you would make us wise. Mm -hmm. That you would give us the wisdom, not the wisdom of the world, but the wisdom that comes from above. Your wisdom. Mm -hmm. yes. Father, help us to be the salt. Help us to be the light. And one of the best ways that we can do that is by living our lives under the wisdom and authority of your word. Mm -hmm. God, thank you for what you're going to do tonight through your word. Help us all to leave here wiser than we came in. Mm -hmm. We love you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I was joking with Leslie earlier, and uh, I don't know if any, I don't know if y'all noticed or not, but yeah, there was a, that was a five point sermon this morning. Did y'all? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not unusual. <laughs> Usually it's three, right? So this morning was five, and tonight is two. <laughs> but, but, but. <laughs> and there's some subcategories. <laughs> the the, the first. What's that? You must be hungry. <laughs> <laughs> the first uh, truth that we see in the text is that true wisdom is uh, demonstrable. We, it, can be, it can be demonstrated, right? Uh, anyone can claim to be wise and to have understanding. But the proof of whether someone is truly wise and whether they have understanding or not it is in how they conduct themselves, right? Actions speak louder than words. We hear that all the time. Right. Uh, true wisdom is demonstrated through wise actions. Right? True wisdom is demonstrated through wise actions. What we say matters very little if our actions do not match what we say. Isn't that one of the issues of the church? Right. The accusations, and, and rightly so, of many outside the church. Uh, we're called hypocrites because we say one thing and we do something else entirely. James, half-brother of Jesus, he was not impressed with big talk and big words. And guess what? Neither is God. That's right. We talked about that in discipleship as well. He's not impressed with our many words, right. with our big words. James was not captivated by the writings of the great philosophers of his day. Aristotle, Plato, right? You've heard these guys' names before. Great thinkers, brilliant men. James was not mesmerized by the theological ramblings that were uh, continually coming out of the synagogues. Surely James had grown to despise the hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees, just like Jesus' his big brother did. 
you remember Jesus would call them things like a den of vipers. Or he called them whitewashed tomb, beautiful on the outside, but full of dead men's bones. They looked good on the outside, and they always said what seemed to be the right things. But their actions and attitudes demonstrated that their lives were not being guided and directed by the true wisdom of God and God's word, the wisdom that comes from above. James began this section by challenging his readers and us perception of what true wisdom looks like. Verse 13 says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Right? Question yourselves. He's questioning them, questioning us. Let him show by good conduct that his work, his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. You see, our attitudes and actions will demonstrate whether true wisdom is actually present in our lives or not. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what I say. All right, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come out. James was sure to point out that our attitudes and actions are directly connected. He used the word meekness here to describe the attitude of someone that is conducting themselves in a truly wise manner. You know who was known for being meek? Jesus. Right. Jesus. The word translated meekness could also be tra translated as gentleness. That this meekness comes from the presence of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That James was saying that it's impossible for someone to be very, that it was, that it's, it's, it's possible, let me get my words straight here, for someone to be very intelligent, for someone to be very smart and still be completely ignorant in regards to the wisdom of God's word. Amen. The wisdom that comes from above. Because sometimes we get impressed by smart people. Right? Smart people, very intelligent people. They just kind of wow us that they can figure all this stuff out. But you see, being intelligent, being smart, and being wise aren't the same thing. That's right. Especially in a biblical sense. So, in fact, sometimes it's a person's intellectual intelligence that is a great hindrance for him or her coming to faith in, in Christ. That's why so many colleges, so many universities are such hard places is to, to win people to Christ because they're constantly being influenced by their unbelieving professors. The culture, the culture there is toxic that rejects the teachings of the Bible. That's why it's so hard. You see, a saved person has been given a new heart and a new mind that is capable of being filled with the true wisdom that comes from time spent in God's Word. But here's the thing, it's not automatic. I wish it was. I've said before, I, I, I wish that, that, that I could just put my Bible under my pillow at night. And just, just through osmosis, that the, the wisdom of God's Word would just, would just seep in through my, my, my skull, through the pillow overnight. But I, it doesn't work that way. I wish it did. It's not automatic. We must regularly be exposing ourselves to God's Word. Paul, Paul told Timothy to be diligent in his study of God's Word. 2 Timothy 2.15 Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. We can't be diligent to do God's Word unless we are first diligent to know God's Word. That's right. We can't do what God's Word says if we don't know what God's Word says. That we must be willing to wrestle with the scriptures. Wrestle. Even good old Peter said that, that some of Paul's writings are difficult. <laughs> right? We've come to discover that ourselves. There are some things in there that are hard. There are some things, some mysterious things that we don't understand. And, and, we, and truth be told, we won't ever understand them here right. on this side of heaven. Sometimes we must be willing to do what Jacob did in Genesis 32 and wrestle with God. Yeah. Wrestle with God in his word until he blesses us with the true wisdom that comes from above. The Apostle Paul was a, a very intelligent man, as, 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 as much of an intelligent man as we would ever meet. And as a Pharisee of Pharisees, he knew the Bible. At that point, the Old Testament, that's all they had. 
He knew it. He knew it like the back of his hand. His mind was sharp and he could quickly process information and give a reasoned response with little delay. Even before he was saved, this is how God wired him. Right? He, he's not one of those guys that you want to try to get into a, a, a debate with. He's quick. His mind processes information incredibly fast. But before he got saved, he was merely operating in his own wisdom and not from the true wisdom that comes from above. But all that changed once he got saved, once he received his new heart and his new mind when he met Christ on the Damascus Road. So how do we know that Paul got saved? Because he demonstrated true wisdom through his attitudes and actions, right? He was a changed man. He was a changed man, totally different than he was before. Because it could be seen through his good conduct, as James says here, in, in the meekness of wisdom. Because the fruit of the Spirit was evident in his life, he listed the fruit in Galatians 5, 22 to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. So let me just ask you, is your life marked by demonstrations of true wisdom? Is it? Is it marked? Can people see Christ at work within your life? Right? If we say, can, can, can people see Christ in you? You see, James also dealt with what it looked like to not demonstrate true wisdom. In verses 14 to 16, we just call this worldly wisdom. It says, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. Where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. What does that describe today? Where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and everything, every evil thing are there. Confusion reigns today. Confusion reigns today. People don't even know what gender they are anymore. All of a sudden, here we are this far along in human history, and all of a sudden now we're not sure. Well, some people aren't. God's sure. Amen. Genesis says he created a male and female. That's it. Right. James acknowledges that it's possible for saved people to think and behave like lost people think and behave. Now I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Because if you're like me, you're guilty of this. There's, there's times... Sometimes there's multiple times in a week where I, my, my mind begins to think things it shouldn't think. There's situations that come up and I don't respond in a biblical way. I, sometimes I shock myself at what I think. What my first response is. My, my first instinct to do. It shocks me. That I, sometimes I, I think and want to respond in a way that a lost person would. It's possible. Right. You know it's possible too. Right. Surely I'm not the only one. You deal with the same thing. We all know this to be true. Worldly wisdom is the type of wisdom that we, we operate in when we fail to live our lives according to the true wisdom of God's Word. This is what happens when we walk in the flesh instead of the Spirit. This is the only type of wisdom that lost people have. Unregenerate hearts, unregenerate minds, this is all that they're capable of. Worldly wisdom is demonstrated primarily through acts of selfishness. As James says here, self-seeking. Selfishness is the exact opposite of meekness and Christ-likeness. When we're operating from a place of selfishness, everything tends to revolve around us. Well, I don't like that. Right? What about me? Me, me, me. The world revolves around 
me and what I want. Everything is about us and what we want with no consideration for others. Well, what about, what about her? What about what she thinks? What about what she needs? What about what she wants? What about it? Selfishness, self-seeking. Disciples were prone to make decisions based off of worldly wisdom. As we read through the Gospels and we see Jesus' interactions with the disciples, it, it, it kind of puzzles us. So how could, how could they still be like this? They've been with Jesus 24-7 uh, uh, for, for somewhere on that spectrum. Depends on where we are in the Gospels. Uh, between a few weeks to a few years, and, and even as they approach the cross, getting close to three years, and yet we still see the flesh. We still see worldly wisdom at, at work within them. In Mark 10, James and John, we know, asked Jesus to sit by his side in glory in his kingdom. And then Mark 14 tells us that some of them began to, to, to be indignant with a, with a, when a woman poured an expensive bottle of fragrant of all fragrant all on Jesus' feet. Remember that? They, 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 they were, you know, oh my goodness. They, 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 of course, they were acting like they were being righteous and they were thinking about how they could sell that, that, all, that fragrant all, that perfume, and, and get the money and they could help the poor, but that's not really where their hearts were. And then Luke 9, it was also James and John who wanted to call down fire from heaven on a Samaritan village that wouldn't welcome Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. Look at Luke 9. 51 to 56. Because this, I think we can identify with this because sometimes this is what we want to do. We, 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 we want to respond this way. It says, Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And, and as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Sometimes we need to check ourselves. We need to check ourselves. We need to check what manner of spirit we are walking into. Right? What, what manner of spirit are we operating in? The spirit of God or the spirit of the flesh? James would also say that we are demonstrating the wisdom of the world when we grow bitter and envious when other people have success. How do you respond when a co-worker gets a promotion or gets a, an award? Right? Are you happy for them? Are you genuinely happy for them? You support them and, and, and you just want to celebrate with them. In verse 15, James says, that kind of wisdom does not descend from above. That kind of wisdom is earthly, sensual, and demonic. It's worldly and, and sinful. It's demonic wisdom. Those two words don't even go together. But that's what we see here. In verse 16, James says that that kind of wisdom creates confusion in every evil thing. And we can see this happening in the third chapter of our Bibles, where the serpent tempted and distorted and confused what God had intended for Adam and Eve. Genesis 3, 1 through 7 says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the tree of the garden, the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Of course, that wasn't that wasn't what he said. That wasn't what he said. There's some additions there. Then the serpent said to the woman, You shall you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of, eat it, eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and 
that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. You see, it was this worldly wisdom that condemned all of humanity under sin. This type of wisdom, this demonic wisdom. Worldly wisdom is still damaging and destroying the lives of all those that choose to continue to think and behave in that manner. The worldly wisdom can destroy marriages because the roles of husbands and wives are much different than that the true wisdom of God's Word teaches. The roles of husbands and wives according to God's Word is much different than the culture. That's right. If you haven't noticed, it's much different. That's why we have so much tension within the homes nowadays because people are reading better homes and gardens instead of reading their Bibles. That's right. Worldly wisdom can destroy churches over power struggles and personal preferences and all the pettiness over things that really do not matter. Worldly wisdom can destroy any chance for someone to come to faith in Christ because it denies that there is a need for the wisdom that comes from above. Worldly wisdom is earthly. It's sensual. It's demonic. Worldly wisdom creates Nothing but confusion. That's right. Simply put, worldly wisdom is evil. It's evil and it must be rejected. And so what kind of wisdom is being demonstrated through your actions and attitudes? What do people see in you? I'm not asking you what you say. I'm asking, do you, asking you what do you do? What do people know you for? The second truth that we see in the text is that true wisdom is definable. It's definable. Verses 17 and 18 says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. The biggest difference between true wisdom and worldly wisdom is the source and the intent of the wisdom. All right, the source and the intent of the wisdom. Someone that is walking in true wisdom, the true wisdom of God is intent on living in a way that is pleasing to God. All right, these individuals want to bring honor to God and glory to God with their lives. Someone that is walking in the true wisdom of God is intent on serving and meeting the needs of others. Why? Why? Because that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. This type of wisdom cannot be gained from any kind of an intellectual experience. This type of wisdom can only come from God himself. That's right. James says this type of wisdom comes from above. And it's only available to God's people. Lost people don't live with God's interest in mind, much less the interest of others. They could care less. Someone who don't follow Christ, an unbeliever, they have no concern whatsoever. If we try to say, well, look what God's Word says, I don't, I don't, I don't really care what God's Word says. I don't, I don't care what God's Word says. That's what they'll tell us. Now, to be clear, as we look through this list, lost people are capable of being peaceable. They're, they're capable of being gentle, willing to yield. They can even be merciful and partial and non-hypocritical. But those things do not define who they are on a regular basis. They can do those things. They're capable. And they certainly aren't capable of producing the fruits of righteousness because that only comes from someone that has received a new heart and a new mind. They've been made righteous. We have been made righteous through our faith in Christ. You see, in many respects, James' definition of true wisdom lines up with what Jesus said in the Beatitudes of Matthew 5. Matthew 5, 3 through 12. 
It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, there's that word, for they shall inherit the, the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So let me just ask you, do you possess the attitudes of the Beatitudes? Do you possess the attitudes of the Beatitudes? Can, can these seven traits that are listed here in verse 17 be seen in your life? Firstly, true wisdom is defined as being pure, right? Being pure. No mixture of good and bad, not tainted with evil. To be genuine and sincere when serving others. There, you have no agenda or, or no expectations of anything in return. Your motives are pure. When you ask somebody, can you do something for someone? They, they, they don't expect you. You're, they know, you're not trying to manipulate anyone. Your motives are pure. Secondly, true wisdom is defined by being peaceable. I believe this means to be both at peace with oneself and also with God. And you want to live with at peace with all people. To live in peace with all people, known to be known to be a peacemaker instead of a troublemaker. That represents true wisdom. Thirdly, true wisdom is defined by being gentle, being courteous with others, being patient with others, being nice, <laughs> right? How odd is that? How, how, how much of a difference would that make? How, how strange would you be by just being nice? There's a shortage of wisdom, but there's also a great shortage of being nice these days. Don't be a jerk. Speak and treat others with respect, even in areas of disagreement. How about that? Even in areas of disagreement. Proverbs 15, 1, Book of Wisdom. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Let me just pause and ask a question. As we're looking at this, this list, who does it sound like James is describing? Jesus, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound like who he's, who he's describing here? When we're defining true wisdom, it's undeniable that we're describing the very same traits that we saw in Jesus throughout the Gospels. Right? Jesus was willing to yield, was he not? He was willing to yield. He was willing to set aside his preferences for the sake of others. I'm pretty sure it was his preference, wasn't his, his preference to, to leave the glory of heaven, only to be despised, only to be ridiculed, only to be mocked, beaten, and crucified. That wasn't his preference, but he yielded. He yielded. He yielded to the will of his Father so that we could be forgiven of our sins and be reconciled back to God. Being willing to yield means not always having to have everything go your way. Right? Not everything has to go your way all the time. True wisdom is defined by being willing to yield. Jesus was also full of mercy. We talked about that some this morning. Because everyone sins, everyone deserves to experience God's full wrath without exception. Without exception. That's why Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. But because of Jesus and the fact that he is full of mercy, Romans 6.23 also says that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's why those of us who have received mercy from Jesus must be full of mercy towards others. Full of mercy towards others. True wisdom is defined by being full of mercy. 
We also know that Jesus was and is without partiality. Without partiality. He treated everyone the same. And guess what? That drove the religious leaders nuts. They couldn't stand that. They couldn't understand that. How, 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 can, your, how can your teacher sit and eat meals with sinners and tax collectors? Don't even know they're unclean? How, how could he do this? Because Jesus was without partiality. That's how. He treated everyone with love. He treated everyone with dignity. He treated everyone with respect, regardless of who they were. And as a matter of fact, his death and resurrection were without partiality too. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, again, there's that without partiality, whoever, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. True wisdom is defined by being without partiality. And Jesus was without hypocrisy. Jesus said what he meant and meant what he said. That's right. He wasn't wishy-washy. He didn't flip-flop. He didn't bow down to the pressures to be culturally correct, politically correct. The cultural norms did not shape him. He was the one that was going to shape the cultural norms. Uh, 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 flip the cultural norms on their head. He was always consistent in everything that he said, all his teachings. He was always the same person wherever he went and whoever he was with. He didn't act one way with this group of people and act another way with another group of people. As I said earlier, this is the biggest complaint against Christians because so many of us struggle to be consistent and how we behave and how we treat others. Can we just be honest for a second? We can tend to be two-faced. Mm -hmm. Right? We can come across that way at times. We'll act one way at church and while we're around other Christians. And then we'll act another way when we're at work or when we're at school. I mean, sure, we're nice and we're sweet here. And we, we, we don't say ugly things and all that, right? While we're here, while we're around the believers. But, but let us get to work and be around unbelievers. Let us get to school and, and be around other un, you know, unbelievers there. And, and then all of a sudden, we, like, we just switch. And we begin to act like we don't know Jesus too. The true wisdom is defined by being without hypocrisy, is what James said. <coughs> <coughs> David Platt summed up the blessings of true wisdom this way. <coughs> he says, God's wisdom produces that which is right, that which is pleasing and honoring to God, and that which is good for the people of God. God's wisdom is good for us. That's right. It's profitable for us. It's right for us. Walking in the true wisdom of God on a daily basis makes everything better in life. Everything, everything's better when we walk according to the true wisdom of God's Word. Our relationship with the Lord will be better. Amen? Amen. It will be better. It'll be, more, it'll be deeper. It'll be richer. It'll be more meaningful. Our marriages will be better. Amen? Amen? Our marriages will be better. They'll flourish according to God's design for marriage. Our church will be healthier. Much healthier than it is. We'll prosper because we'll be, we'll be willing to set aside our personal preferences and our selfish ambition, ambitions. It'll be about we instead of me. That's right. We instead of me. Instead, we'll do what Hebrews 10.24 says. And consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Instead of being envious of one another, we'll do what Romans 12.10 says and be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. What a difference our church would be. What a difference every church would be if we operated within the true wisdom of God's Word. Most of our problems, 
I, I would say it's safe to say 99.9% of our problems can be traced back to us making decisions based off of the wisdom of the world instead of the wisdom that comes from above. 99.9% of our issues. So as the people of God, let's make sure that every decision that we make is based off of the true wisdom of God's Word. Amen? Closing tonight, I was asked you again, evaluate yourself. I'm not asking for a show of hands. I don't want you to, to, to scream out your answer. This is for you. It's not even for God. It's for you. God already knows. That's right. God already knows. What type of wisdom is your life characterized by? And, and I don't want you to overthink it. I'll just keep it simple. Here's a, here's a, here's a real easy way to answer the question. Here's an easy way to think about it. Worldly wisdom is self-centered. Right? Are you a self-centered individual? Is everything about you? Right? If everything is about you and you always get swollen up when things don't go your way, then you're operating with, within or from a place of worldly wisdom. True wisdom is uh, is is well, everything's about God and others. It's it's God and others centered. Everything about is about God and other people. What does God want me to do? Right? How, how, how would God be honored with this? How would God be glorified in this? How can I serve this person? How can I serve the church better? Everything is about God and others. If that's you, then your life is characterized by true wisdom. See, if you're a Christian, you know what a train wreck your life used to be. What a train wreck your life used to be when you lived your life based off of the wisdom of the world. And James has just reminded us that worldly wisdom has no place in the life of a believer. Not even a little bit. That's right. Worldly wisdom is demonic and sinful, that's why. It opposes true wisdom. The wisdom that comes from above. That's why worldly wisdom has no place in the life of a believer. But there might be some of here, you here tonight that aren't believers yet. All you, all you have access to, all you are capable of operating from is a place of this worldly wisdom. All you're capable of is this, this demonic type of wisdom that, that leaves you confused about everything. But if you're not a Christian, there is a much better way of living that is available to you tonight. So it must be received by faith. Right. Must be received by faith. Deep down inside, you know this type of life isn't right. The life that you're living now isn't right. It's not what God wants for you. You know something's wrong. And I, I pray that, that as, as Mr. Lee always says, that, that you have a troubled heart right now. Mm -hmm. I, I, I pray and I hope and I pray that, that, that your, your heart rate is, 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 is peaking right now because your heart is racing because the Spirit of God is, 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 is convicting you of your lostness right now. You feel so nervous right now. Don't panic, that's good. That's, right. that's a good thing. Having the wrong type of wisdom isn't your biggest problem. You need to get saved. Right? right? You, 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 can't, you can't think right. You can't live in a way that's pleasing to God until you have a new heart and a new mind. That only comes through placing your faith in Jesus. When you repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus, you will be saved from the power and the penalty of your sins, but you'll also receive the wisdom that comes from above. And that will change your life forever. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right. Let me pray for us. And we'll have a time of response. God in heaven, we, we give you praise tonight. We praise you for your righteousness. We praise you for your holiness. God, we praise you for your goodness. We thank you for the wisdom that you have. You're all-knowing. You're all-powerful. 
And God, you ask us as your son and your daughters to seek your face, to live in a way that's pleasing to you, that we're to humble ourselves before you. You tell us if we, if we lack wisdom, let us ask. And you're certain to give it. Father, help us as your sons and your daughters to not look to the wisdom of this world, but look to you for true wisdom. It doesn't really matter what people think in the culture around us, the, the great thinkers, the experts that think they know everything. Father, you are the, the great know-it-all. You're the only one who can truly say that. You do know everything. And so, Father, if we want to, to know what's right and to always be able to do what's right in your side, we must know your word. So, Father, I pray that we would be diligent about your word, that we would commit ourselves to to, to making time to spend with you and your word. Because if we don't, all we're going to be capable of is worldly wisdom. And that brings dishonor to your name and discredits us as your sons and your daughters and, and does harm to your church. So Father, I pray that your people, that my brothers and sisters in Christ, that we would get serious about true wisdom, the wisdom that comes from above. Father, we also pray for those here with us tonight that have not yet been saved. I pray that you would touch their hearts, that you'd give them the courage to step out and say, I want to follow Jesus. I realize that I've been living my own way. I realize that I've been living in a way that's not pleasing to, to God. And I'm a sinner. I need to be forgiven. I need grace. I need mercy. And that forgiveness, that grace, that mercy is found in Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I pray that you would touch their hearts. That you would add to your kingdom tonight. Father, help us to be faithful. Help us to be a people. Help us to be a church. Help us to be individuals that our lives are shaped and our lives are characterized by the true wisdom of your word, the wisdom that comes from above. We love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.